Hello, Healing Overflow with Dr. Toy. I'm Dr. Toy. Welcome back, y'all. It's so good to see you. Well, it's so good to be seen because you're seeing and hearing me, and I'm glad that you return. Listen, Healing Overflow has been so wonderful to me, and I'm hearing from you. Thank you so much for your emails and letting me know how Healing Overflow has been so good to you. I really appreciate it. So keep sharing the podcast. Keep watching because it is helping people to heal. It's helping you to heal. It's helping me to heal. So I thank you. If you have questions for Ask the Therapist segment, you know where to send it. You can send it straight to my email, Toya J at pit.edu or in that Qualtrics link. Y'all, I have so many questions. You know I'm going to have to do another Ask the Therapist segment. Y'all already know, probably about three or four of them things because y'all keep asking questions, really good questions. There are awesome questions. Those of you that I read the questions and answer the questions on the Healing Overflow with Dr. Toy podcast, you already know you get your Starbucks gift card. All right. Let's get to it. This is such an important message today. Um, You know, social workers, I'm a social worker. I'm a therapist. I'm a child and family therapist, specifically teenagers and children. I love working with kids, but adults too. Um, A lot of my friends work with the aging population. There is so much that social workers can do. That's why I love my profession, that we work with so many people. But one of the things that we do, we are therapists. We do diagnose, um, you know, disorders. And we use the DSM-5. The latest is DSM-5-TR, which just means there there are revisions. Um, There is a new uh, diagnosis in there. These are just all for my nerdy therapist friends. (laughs) I felt like I was pushing my glasses up when I said that. I love this kind of stuff. But um, just it's a new grief diagnosis, prolonged grief. Um, and then there are always some edits. But the new DSM-6 probably won't be out till like 2025. So my nerdy self can't wait till it comes out. <laughs> but we're talking about anxiety today, which is not a laughing matter. Um, I wanted to give anxiety its own show because I get lots of questions, lots of thoughts, um, people saying things to me when they run into me about anxiety. And I said, this is its own show. I can't just stick um, a question in there at the end of a show. Like anxiety needs to be center stage. And I'm sure this won't be the last one about anxiety. Um, But let's talk about anxiety. I got my DSM five, not the TR, but the five. It's going to be the same diagnosis for anxiety. Um, Because I want y'all that, you know, um, aren't my therapist friends out there. You are my, you know, lay people friends, my regular, normal, wonderful, beautiful friends. And I want you to hear the diagnosis so that you know that sometimes you have anxiety and it's provoked by situations. We call situational anxiety. There's also situational depression and situational mood disorders. But Anxiety can come because a situation is happening, right? So I have a big presentation. I have finals to all my pit students. I know, hold on, y'all. It's almost to the end. Um, I have a job interview. I have a new boss. I have a big project. I have a big presentation coming up. Um, You know, my my kids, for all all of my parents out there, you know, my kids... My, my kids are struggling through this or school or something like that. It's a situation. You know, my relationship is, is rocky right now. I don't know what's going on. Um, that could be happening to you. And anxiety can come because of existential situations. That means something's going on in my life that's causing me to feel anxious. Okay, Dr. Toy, we know that. I know, but I'm, I got to normalize this thing because sometimes we feel like, oh, why am I anxious? Why am I nervous about this? Well, that's something you should be anxious and nervous about. We have natural anxiety that saves our lives. It keeps us healthy. It's primitive anxiety. So if I walk up, you know, I'm going I'm to let y'all in on a little fear of mine. I don't fear a whole lot of stuff, but I can't stand like being like on like on the side of like a really high cliff. I don't know if I'm afraid of heights because I can go up in elevators and just walk across bridges and things like that. But if I'm like at Niagara Falls or something, I'm not kidding around, y'all. I'm like, mm-mm. I don't like to be at the edge. Or if I'm on a cruise, 
I, I pushed my kids back. Everybody got to get back because I don't want you falling in. That is actually not an abnormal fear. Look how I just made myself normal. Um, because it's keeping us alive. I shouldn't be hanging over the side of the banister in Niagara Falls. I shouldn't be doing that. There's a, there's a reason that I don't get out my car on the bridge and just decide to eat lunch and dangle my feet over, you know, one of the million bridges we have in Pittsburgh. There's a reason, and, and it's natural primitive fear. It's that part of the brain, the oldest part of the brain, the reptilian part, that says, I need to keep you healthy, safe, alive, all of that, okay? It's a healthy fear. That is not what we're talking about today. We're talking about anxiety that seems to just be around, lingering, tapping you on the shoulder, um, waking you up in the middle of the night because you can't have panic attacks and anxiety in the middle of the night. It's horrible. <laughs> it's horrible. Um, anxiety that feels like somebody's putting a black mask over your face and smooshing your head tight and an elephant on your chest. That's the anxiety we're talking about today. So I'm going to talk about generalized anxiety disorder and I'm going to talk about panic disorder or anxiety um, anxiety attacks, okay? They're the same. So panic attacks, anxiety attacks, all of that. So I'm going to read out of the DSM-5, generalized anxiety disorder. So um, my LSW, LCSW, my LPCs, my PsyDs, all of us, we diagnose, um, and, and MDs and psychiatrists also, um, we diagnose out of our DSM-5 or DSM-5-TR, okay? And you have to have a certain amount of criteria in order to get this diagnosis. So when people are like, I have anxiety disorder, you may or may not, you may have anxiety symptoms or it might be a situation. So anyway, let's get at it. Excessive anxiety and worry, apprehensive expectation occurring more days than not for at least six months. Okay, that's criteria. We have to have certain criteria in place. About a number of events or activities such as work or school performance, the individual finds it difficult to control the worry. Now this is different than I'm worried about the situation. Let me breathe. Okay, let me change a couple you know, ways that I'm thinking about it. I feel better already. Thank you. My, my friend on the phone talked me down. I feel better already. It's not anxiety disorder. It's nothing you can just shake off. Like, oh, let me stop worrying about this. It's usually persistent. It's more days than not. And sometimes it seems to come out of nowhere. Like, I woke up, I got anxiety. Why? Nothing's even going on today. Why do I feel this, like, ever-present cloud of doom and something's about to happen? It just feels like something bad's about to happen. That feeling. That's anxiety, y'all. Okay, I'll keep reading. The anxiety and worry are associated with three or more of the following six symptoms. With at least one symptom having been present for more Days than not for the past six months. Only one item is required for children. You know, I'm going to talk about the kids. And I have, I have a remedy or a suggestion of an intervention for children. And I have some things for uh, uh, we adults too. Okay. I love my kids. So, restlessness or feeling keyed up, on edge, being fatigued, anxiety, it wears you down. Especially if you're not sleeping. Anxiety can keep you up. It can wake you up. But it can also make you so full of adrenaline and cortisol, all the stress hormones, and you're just uh, all high all day. Okay? It'll wear you down physically. Okay. Difficulty concentrating or mind going blank. You're speaking. Your mind's going blank. I'm not talking about the over 40, over 50 syndrome. <laughs> I'm talking about you, you're usually like, now you're going, what was I about to say? And that constant, like, you know, jitter in your chest. I'm talking about the huge butterflies. When I work with children, I talk about little butterflies, medium-sized butterflies, big, huge butterflies. It's normal to have butterflies in our stomach right before I have to get up and talk to somebody. Or I have to ask this difficult question of one of my friends. That's normal. Those huge butterflies stay around all day. What is wrong with me feeling? Okay? That's anxiety. Irritable, just snappy feeling. My muscles are tense. I feel like I'm like this all the time. 
I'm not talking about right before a test. I'm talking about this is just me more days than not, okay? Shoulders are, are in my ears. Um, sleep disturbance, I talked about that. Restlessness, unsatisfied sleep. The anxiety, worry, or physical symptoms cause clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. I can't seem to focus at work. I am nervous in meetings. I can't seem to concentrate in class. I'm worried about everything the professor's saying. What? When's our test? Oh, that's, wait, is that due tomorrow? Ah, you have your syllabus right there. It could calm your mind. Am I going to graduate? When I graduate, when am I going to be? Am I going to be good at what I do? Did I get this degree for nothing? Am I going to find a job? Okay, that, that's normal anxiety, but when it becomes to, to a point where it is overshadowing the, your brain, you're, you're not able to concentrate on things. You're not able to focus. And it's more times than it's not that you are feeling this anxiety and this constant script of, I'm not going to be good enough. I'm going to fail. I don't know if I'm going to make it. I'm gonna... That's anxiety. That's not the good anxiety, okay? Some anxiety and some fear push and motivate it motivate us. That's what we like. You know, if someone's like, you got to have this done, it needs to be great. And you put in hours into a project and then you get up there and knock it out. Like, whoa, that was so good. Well, that anxiety actually compelled you and propelled you to be great. That's not what I'm talking about. Competition, being competitive, that's a little anxiety in there. That's okay because our athletes are top athletes because they allow anxiety, a little fear, you know, to push them. I need to be better. I need to be great. That's good anxiety. That ain't what we're talking about today. <laughs> All right. Um, the disturbance is not attributed to physiological effects um, of a substance. So, it cannot be attributed to drug and alcohol, anything like that. We have to we have to rule that out. And disturbance is not better explained by another mental disorder. Okay, so it can be another uh, mental disorder or physiological disorder that can explain it. If that is such, then it's not anxiety generalized anxiety disorder, or we call it GAD, um, ICD-10 code F41-1. To all my nerdy therapist friends. We just geeked out bad on that. Okay? That's all I'm going to go there. Oh, of course, anxiety um, can be caused by caffeine and substance and things like that, opiate, things like that. That has to be ruled out. Now, let's talk about panic disorder. Okay? Panic disorder, those, those are the feel like I'm going to die panic attacks. Okay? So, panic... Panic disorder is physical and physiological distress, okay? It seems like panic attacks seem like they come out of nowhere. I'm just sitting here minding my own business. Next thing you know, I'm shaking. My heart's beating. I'm breathing irregularly. Uh, my eyes are darting around. I can't, I can't catch my breath, okay? I have this um, nausea in my stomach, um, heart pounding, sweating, chest pain, feeling dizzy, uh, feeling like you're choking, tingling in, in your arms um, and your fingers, your legs, uh, feeling detached, fear of losing control. I have so many clients, so many people that will explain anxiety and say, it feels like I am dying, like I'm having a heart attack. Um, some and a lot of people, y'all, have gone to the hospital. That might be you gone to the emergency room and said, I'm having a heart attack. I feel like I'm going to die. My chest, elephant on my chest, pressure in my head, in my body. That's a good old-fashioned panic attack. Panic attacks last for about 10 minutes. Physiologically, it'll go up, it'll peak, and it'll go down. That's exactly what it has to do. It feels like it's lasting forever. I have people say, Dr. Jones, I've had a panic attack last the whole day. It doesn't last the whole day. Its effects or its residue last the whole day because all of those stress hormones in your body stay in there until you get them out. You have to get them out through movement, um, jogging in place, things like that, jumping jacks, things like that help. 
Um, but that, that's panic disorder. Okay, y'all? Okay. So, they can be very se severe. When people make light of panic attacks, that, that is very annoying to me. <laughs> because panic attacks feel awful. It feels real because it is real. People will say things like, it's not real. It's, it's just what your mind thinks is happening. Well, if your mind thinks it's happening, then it's real. It's an alarm system. The alarm is going off. You ever Have you ever been in a building? You sit in there, you're calm, you're talking to someone, and the fire alarm goes off. And everybody, you know, they freeze or they move. It's ready, ready to go or they start looking for the fire to fight. Remember the fight, flight, or freeze response that I talked about? Season one, go back, listen to it because this has everything to do with anxiety. When our brain is signaled that there is trouble, there is danger, there is something to fret, then that reptilian, reptilian part of the brain says, hey, look, y'all, there's, there's a big problem. We need to get down to business here, and we have to fight, flight, or freeze. So the body will go into that. That's why we're getting the heart racing, the blood is moving faster, the breathing. All of that is the sympathetic nervous system. It is doing its job, but it doesn't mean that it's right all the time, okay? I'll break this down. It's being triggered by something. Um, the root of your anxiety is what I like to think about as a clinician and my clinician friends out there. We want to get to the root. What is causing this anxiety? Could it be post-traumatic stress? It very well could be. Could it be, I'm just a, you know, a keyed up kind of person. And you say I'm very animated. I like it. The kids like it too. Um, and you might have grown up around parents or a guardian caretaker that was always kind of up here. So you're up here too. You're already full. Let me give you a demonstration. I got props today, y'all. <laughs> of course, I had to use a University of Pittsburgh cup. Okay, so we have thresholds, right? And this is life. Life stressors are going to happen. You can't control what happens on the outside most of the time. Now, our thresholds, some of them are higher, some of them are lower. I tend to have a high threshold to stress because I'm crisis trained. You know, starting out, I think I, I, I was one of those little worrying kids, just worrying about my test and worrying about the dog and worrying about my cat and worry, you know. Um, but a lot of us, thresholds, you know, we can only take but so much. And so then it keeps going and going. Let me make sure I don't wet up the whole entire table. Get my cup under my plate, okay? And then stress comes. And then more stress. All right. The bills are due. I can't pay my tuition. I have a big paper. I don't understand it. My relationship, they are not acting right. <laughs> Ooh, whoa. You see that, y'all? One more thing. My dog got sick. Ooh. We overflowed, okay? That's what happens. And sometimes it's a big mess in our lives, okay? It's, it's not neat when stress overflows. That is when anxiety reaches its peak and anxiety attack happens, a panic attack happens, okay? So what we like to talk about in therapy is lessening that load so this is what therapy does you pouring it out talking to your friends okay cbt i'm a cbt -er. emdr as well cbt um stopping those negative thoughts and replacing them with positive thoughts um there's an anxiety tool called act as if okay i'm pouring it out Act as if everything's okay. And if everything was okay, how would I act? 
and you are making your body go through these movements as if everything's okay. Um, music, walks, exercise, meditation, okay? These are some of the things that have been proven to help yoga. Now, people will say, just shake it off, breathe, stop worrying about it, pray it away, meditate it away. That's not always a solution. It can help, but a lot of times it'll be connected to the solution. I'm going to tell y'all what, I'm not a pill pusher, but sometimes we need antidepressants. We need serotonin uptakes. That's just all these fancy words for it. Psychotropic medication, psych meds, medication to help reduce the anxiety level. That's it. Now, if you have something wrong in your body, you already know how I talk, y'all. If, if I have excruciating pain in my back because I pulled a muscle, I'm not going to just keep walking around with excruciating pain. I'm going to take some pain reliever and get relief. So if you need medication, it's okay to go to your PCP or a psychiatrist. I always recommend a psychiatrist because they're, they're literally have a doctorate in like mind medicine. <laughs> Why wouldn't I go to you? You know, um, our MDs or PCPs, they know it, but psych, psychiatrists specialize it. Not psychologists, psychiatrists, okay? They prescribe the medicine. No, they're only folks that can prescribe. Um, and that can help alleviate a lot of that stress and anxiety in your body and help you to be able to think straight and get your frontal lobe back in the driver's seat, acting and making decisions, being the executive director, okay? So I want to talk about also, um, those are some of the solutions, some of the treatments that work. Um, I like to do a lot of somatic work as well. Somatic work is, um, you know, you feel a lot of the symptoms of anxiety in your body before you even realize that you're thinking of things that are causing the anxiety. And so a lot of body work, you know, muscle progressive relaxation is awesome. We squeeze in different muscle groups and relaxing it with your deep breathing. All of those things help. Sometimes people will say, just relax, breathe deeply. But your body can't relax until it gets the stress hormones out. And so, you know, going to yoga and relaxing all the time is, is not always helping with anxiety. Sometimes you have to get the stress out and then relax. And getting the stress out could be swimming, singing. I'm a singer. I love singing. So things like that can get the stress out. Then you can do the relaxation stuff. Okay. I want to address also... Um, what anxiety looks like to other people. Because I've had people tell me, I love when y'all talk to me, <laughs> have people tell me, I seem moody, but it's really my anxiety. Um, I fly off at the handle, but it's really my anxiety. Um, I look crazy. People think I'm angry, but it's really my anxiety. I want to start with this first. Anxiety is not yours. Do not own and possess that mess. <laughs> anxiety is your natural, your body and brain's natural way. It's the system. It reacts to stuff, okay? I'm being as, the least technical as I can. It's not yours, though. It's your body's. It's natural reaction, okay? That's just, you know, um, don't possess it, okay? Okay. Uh, you can't hear because the frontal lobe is cut off and it's hard for you to hear others. It's hard to react instead of overreacting. And so what we have to do is switch the prefrontal lobe back into control, okay? So those are the myths that, you know, if I just stay away from stress or I just need to relax or I need to meditate, those, those are myths, that, that doesn't happen, you know, instantly all the time. But let me, let me share what um, a couple things that, that I read, and I, and I really liked it, um, that it isn't 
um, anxiety can be external, but not always. Um, don't keep, this is my tip, don't keep anxiety to yourself. Don't be embarrassed. What are you embarrassed about? Let me tell you, there are millions of Americans, millions, millions of Americans that deal with anxiety and panic disorder. And sometimes panic disorder goes with depression and agoraphobia and another type of phobia. There's like a thousand phobias, <laughs> so many phobias. It goes together. So you don't have to suffer in silence. You did nothing wrong. You, it doesn't mean that you're weak. Oh, you should have done this, this, and this. Um, diet can be a reason because there are foods that cause anxiety. I read a whole book. I can't remember the author. Sorry, author. Um, that talked about uh, foods that cause depression and anxiety. And a lot of times, eating those a whole bunch of sugar and carby stuff and things and processed foods that that can cause a reaction in your body and cause you to have depression and anxiety. So that's my little toy tip, my doctor toy tip. Um, but don't blame yourself. You're not weak. It's not your fault. Um, you can get relief and you don't deserve to suffer with anxiety. You, this is not a life sentence. You can heal from anxiety. Um, it's not a one size fits all. So how you heal and how you gain control of anxiety, it's tailor made to you. A therapist can help you do that. Um, there are certain ways that you can alleviate and relieve um, and get relief from anxiety. And so let me share. I'm going to share something that I use with children um, because I said I was going to talk to kids. I also want to let you know that you can use a lot of these tools for yourself. So this is called a feel better bag. I love ice cream, so I drew ice cream on my feel better bag. Um, and I'll tell a, a child, even an adult, because adults love art, um, to think about when you feel at your worst or when you're feeling like you're getting to the point where you're going to feel horrible. You could feel it coming on like, ugh, you're just waking up like, okay, good morning, heartache. <laughs> you know, what is going on? People don't understand. Um, they, they don't understand what a weight it is on you and how hard it is for you to get through the day. They don't, they don't get it, but you can explain it. Like I did the cup. You can explain it like, um, shaking up a pop bottle, um, an alarm system. Just try to explain it a little bit and say, this is not in my control all the time, but I can gain more control through using tools and techniques. Okay. All right. Here's a tool. The Feel Better Bag, love it. Um, it's not mine. I did alter it. Um, I saw Pinterest. <gasps> love Pinterest. Uh, used the Pinterest idea and just made it mine. Um, but you decorate a brown bag. It has to be brown or white so that you can draw on it. You want to make sure you draw on it. I use brown bags for my brown girls in case they want to draw their faces too. So I give them a choice um, in white bags and, and brown bags. And so you draw or you can write words to activities and to interventions that help you feel better. That's exactly what a feel better bag is. So I'll let you in on some of my feel better techniques, some feel better things. Okay. First thing is Thor. That's my dog. He's an American bully. He's very cute, sort of. And... <laughs> He's just a very fun, he's seven years old, but he acts like a puppy. He's just a very fun little dog. So Thor, playing with Thor, messing with him, it makes me giggle and laugh. That makes me feel better. Um, I love to swim. I love water. And so um, I like to, you know, get in some water, whether it be hot tub or swimming pool or something like that. Um, but this reminds me that water, water makes me feel better. I even like the sound of water. Taking walks, especially in the sun, I should have drew a sun in there, um, makes me feel better. Okay, I'm putting that in there. And this one almost always makes me feel better. Even going on YouTube and looking at beaches. Going to a beach 
even better, always makes me feel better. But thinking about a beach and hearing, as soon as I say beach, I can hear seagulls. I can hear them. Can y'all hear them? I hope not, because that would be kind of strange. Um, I can hear them. I can smell the salty ocean. I can tell that I'm getting close to the beach, and that's one of my favorite things, okay? All right, so you can take regular cards. Um, you can take little slips of paper and fill in your Feel Better bag. I love things like markers or colored pencils and just draw things, put it in your Feel Better bag. And when you don't feel so great, pull it out. This is great for kids. They can put stickers on it too. Um, you can put actual things in there. I had clients put like a deck of Uno. I mean, Uno is the funnest game ever. And so they put it in there to remind themselves, play a game of Uno. Bubbles, blowing bubbles. Who doesn't giggle? Have a good time with bubbles, okay? And, and you're putting that in there, but when you're not feeling so great, you're pulling these things out to remind yourself. It's hard to remember coping tools when you are having a panic attack or after you've had a panic attack or before it comes on because preferably you want to get it before it reaches that height, okay? When you wake up or when you are going through the day and anxiety just hit you, I was sitting there minding my own business, anxiety came over and slapped me across the face and went on by itself over there and now I'm filled with anxiety for the rest of the day. Anxiety hits that way. Having a feel better bag or Putting a list of things in your phone. Um, there are so many apps. PTSD Coach is a great app that has all these coping tools in the Manage Symptoms section. Don't have to have PTSD to use it. Um, the Calm app. You can take a moment to breathe. You can take a moment to put on some shoes and walk around the building you work in or you're at school. Something like that. Whatever it is, you want to have it written down and in place so when you are having anxiety and when it's at its peak, you can go to your cheat sheet and remind yourself, okay? All right. I am going to end this podcast with this beautiful letter that I found, and I really wanted somebody to write something that was real and how they experienced it. And I encourage you to do that too. We're not done talking about anxiety. So if there is a letter to yourself, when you are feeling better, write that letter, give yourself encouragement, tell yourself all the things that work to get you out of that dark tunnel feeling of anxiety, write it down when you're feeling good, take advantage of those good days. Write it down, and then when you're feeling that anxiety, when you're feeling that pressure, pull out that letter and encourage yourself, or pull out those reminders of what helps you to feel better. But I found this. Um, the author is Han, and um, I don't know their whole entire real name, but it's an authentic letter to themselves. It's called, Wrote a Letter to Myself When Anxious. And I wanted to share it with y'all because it was so impactful, and I, and I hope that uh, this is something that could work for you. Remember, there are several tools out there that will help alleviate anxiety and you have to go through them and collect them and say, this is what helps me feel better. Put it in a physical feel better bag or a mental feel better bag or write it down. Okay, you're collecting those good things. Let me, let me read this. This was really impactful. Hi, I know you feel scared right now and I know you don't feel real. I know you are catastrophizing. It can be really, really scary to feel like this. It's probably the worst feeling in the world. And you just tell yourself, if I could just feel normal again, I'd never take it for granted. And, when, and then whenever you inevitably feel normal again, you take it for granted. As I am right now as I write this, I know how bad it sucks, the fog, the vision issues, the focus issues, the urgency to fix yourself right then and there, the intrusive thoughts, the doom, the dread, the dizziness, the need to crawl out of your skin, the one to just tear your brain out so you don't feel like this anymore. It all sucks so bad. 
but not forever. Never forever. Whether through medicine or grounding techniques or simply letting time pass, it will fade. You will think clearly again. You will feel like you again. You will want to form bonds and relationships with others again. You will feel connected to the world around you again. You will feel steady again like an anchor, not just a boat floating through a storm. You will feel like a real person again. I know it sounds so far away, but all of this is closer than you think. Try distraction or try some deep breathing. Accept that you're in a current state of anxiety. Accept it as best you can and then turn your attention elsewhere. Letting time pass is the best way to weaken the anxiety state. You can do it. You aren't broken. You're going through a natural stress response of our bodies and it will end. Thank y'all. I hope this was really helpful. I had such a good time talking about anxiety because I know that this topic is so prevalent and I know that a lot of you are struggling with anxiety. A lot of us struggle with anxiety and panic attack disorders. And so I hope that this helps heal or start you on the healing journey. Thank y'all so much for listening and for watching to Healing Overflow with Dr. Toy. Remember, I respond. So put comments down, down in the comment section. Put your comments. If you're dealing with anxiety, let me know. Email me. Let's talk about it. We'll continue to talk about it on Healing Overflow with Dr. Toy Social Work Podcast. Thank you so much for listening and for watching again. And you already know. Share the podcast because as you heal, your healing overflows onto everyone else. Thank you so much. Goodbye.